Hi folks, I wanna share with you a remarkable theorem by one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Uh, it is the Basel problem, which is finding the sum of the reciprocals of the squares. So Leonard Euler, it can be argued, was the best, most prolific, certainly, and uh, creative mathematician of all time. And he proved in 1735 a remarkable theorem uh, early in his career that really put him on the map mathematically. So at the time it was known, Jakob Bernoulli had proved that the sum of the reciprocals of the natural numbers diverges, which is to say it adds up to an infinite quantity. Um, this was known and the natural next question to ask is, what if you just isolate out the squares? What if you reciprocate the squares and try to add those up? What would you get? Bernoulli knew that this number actually had to be finite. In fact, it had to be less than two. And with great labor, you can calculate an approximation. It takes a lot of terms just to figure out the uh, decimal expansion to two places. So it was known that the series converged, but Bernoulli sort of uh, made a plea in a publication based in Basel, hence the name of the problem, an open invitation to the mathematical world to please try to find a closed form solution. So in other words, it's not enough to just find the decimal expansion. We want to know what this number really is, quote unquote. So that's the challenge that Euler took up and his remarkable contribution was to prove that this sum turns out to be pi squared over six, which is just a, a jolting result because on the left-hand side of this equation, you have a, an obvious statement about the squares, some sort of very number theoretic sort of statement. And on the right side, you have the square of pi, which feels very geometric. It is the ratio of circumference to diameter. Why on earth would the sum of the reciprocals of the, of the squares of the natural numbers have anything to do with this constant pi? But there it is, this remarkable theorem, which in more modern notation might be put this way. So um, I'd like to take you through Euler's argument. And a wonderful resource for this is a book called Journey Through Genius by William Dunham. Look up chapter nine, The Extraordinary Sums of Leonard Euler. And uh, it's a wonderful exposition and, and a wonderful book that has uh, many other great theorems as well. So um, here's the strategy we're going to use. We will spend some time understanding the function sine x over x. We're going to express s as an infinite polynomial, that is a Taylor series. And then we're going to find an infinite factorization of the polynomial corresponding to its roots. And then by comparing the Taylor series with this factored formula, we're going to be able to reproduce Euler's result. So this is pretty much Euler's strategy. And, and I'm going to point out for calculus students along the way, some review topics. So the ingredients for this, if you really wanna follow along, you should remember some basic Taylor series and some basic pre-calculus about sine. And, and so we'll look into some details um, along the way. So the function s. So let's start with a simple question. What is the domain of the function s of x equals sine x over x? Well, hopefully the answer leaps to your mind. It's all reals except zero. You can't plug in zero for x. You can't divide by zero, so that's a problem. Okay, that's the domain of this function s. Now let's use Desmos, this wonderful online uh, free utility, to plot this function. And the first thing you'll notice is that uh, nothing strange seems to be happening at zero. So what's going on? Uh, it, the domain was not supposed to include zero. Well, as a matter of fact, if you try to click on the y-intercept, you'll, you'll get a message from Desmos saying that it is indeed undefined. At this point, you should remember from your calculus studies that there's a very important limit that we used when we found the derivative of sine. We needed to show that the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is actually equal to one. So looking at this graph, we see, ah, um, that's why nothing seemed to be going awry because actually as x approaches zero, sine x over x approaches one, and that's why it was hard to, re, uh, to, to see anything uh, funny going on. And by the way, um, this is what we might call a removable discontinuity because if we just fill in the value one at this argument, then we get a continuous function. So that's what we should do. We should redefine s. So we'll just define s to be sine x over x if x is not zero, 
and then just evaluate this to be one if x is zero. So there's our new and improved version of s. And this satisfies the property that has domain r and is in fact continuous on r by this very construction. And in a few moments, we will see that it's actually infinitely differentiable on the whole real axis as well. Um, we won't need that for the proof of Euler's result, but it's a, it's a nice little fact. So let's find the Taylor series for S. Well, we don't really need to find the Taylor series for S directly. We already know that for all X, sine X is given by this Taylor series. This is something you should review if you have to, but the Taylor series for sine X is given by this formula. And we can, once again, go to Desmos and check the various Taylor polynomials. You can truncate this series and get these various polynomials. And you can see how for each X, if you're patient enough, the series will eventually converge to the value of sine x. So here we have our Taylor series for sine x. And then what we're going to do is we're going to simply factor out an x, divide through both sides by x, and there we have uh, a Taylor series for sine x over x. At least it's a power series representation. And we'll notice that the domain of this expression on the left side is is all reals except zero, but the domain on the right side is all real numbers because this power series has infinite radius of convergence. After all, the power series for sine had infinite radius of convergence, so this will as well. And we claim that actually this power series expansion represents the function s that we defined a few moments ago, and of course it does because its value is sine x over x if x is not zero. And clearly, if you plug in zero for x, you just get one. And that was our definition of s of x. So actually, what we've done is we've figured out the power series representation for s of x. And just in passing, we'll note that since the power series has infinite radius of convergence, the function is actually infinitely differentiable on r, as we claimed a moment ago. And we won't need that for the proof, but it is a nice fact. Now. We took all this trouble to give this function a new name s to distinguish it um, from just sine x over x, but we're going to go back to calling it sine x over x, and our attitude is just going to be, we'll, we'll just regard sine 0 over 0 as being 1, then we can just think of sine x as, over x as being um, differentiable on the whole real axis. It's a beautiful function. It's just that its expression at 0 is kind of weird. We should just regard the value there to be 1, and we get this beautiful function. Okay, so let's compare sine x over x with sine x. You should notice that apart from x equals zero, these two functions have to have the same x-intercepts, the same roots, the same zeros. And these zeros occur at all the integer multiples of pi. So let's just take a little side trip through some uh, pre-calculus here and talk about factorization of certain types of polynomials. Suppose I had a polynomial p has roots at negative 3, 2, and 4, and p of 0 is 1. So here's the question. Let's find a formula for p of x. There's actually a really easy solution. You can just write p of x as the product of these three terms. And you'll notice that this is certainly polynomial. And when you plug in x equals negative 3, or x equals 2, or x equals 4, you get 0. So it has the right roots. And also, when you plug in x equals 0, it, of course, is going to give you the value 1. So it satisfies the prerequisites. A little check with Desmos will reveal that this formula does give you the graph that you need. You've got a nice polynomial that goes through 0, 1, and it goes through the roots at negative 3, 2, and 4. Now, this generalizes completely. So if you had a polynomial whose roots were a1, a2, a3, all the way through an, and p of 0 is 1, then a formula for p of x is clearly going to be this. So just by multiplying together these types of terms, you're going to get the polynomial you need. All right, so let's go back to our problem. We've got this beautiful function, and here's Euler's great intuition. He regarded this as simply an infinite degree polynomial, which can be factored the same way that we just discussed. So you've got the value 1 when x equals 0, and you've got roots at the non-zero integer multiples of pi. And so sine x over x should just be written this way. Now we'll notice that the factors, these factors pair up nicely 
using symmetry across the y-axis. So negative pi and pi, negative two pi and two pi, these roots pair up so we can multiply those together to get these quadratic terms. So here we have this factorization for sine x over x. And now we're gonna start expanding this product because what our goal is going to be is we're going to compare this to the Taylor series we originally looked at, and that's gonna be the key moment for us. So here we go, how do we multiply out these terms? So once again, we're just gonna take a little diversion and review some pre-calculus. Suppose you have two binomials that you multiply together. You could distribute one across the other and then distribute these terms back across this way, and you're gonna get this uh, result here. And what we'd like to notice is that the first term is what you get when you choose the terms in the first position of each factor. This term is what you get when you choose the first position in the first factor, the second position in the second factor. Here you have the second position in the first factor, first position in the second factor, and finally, second position in both factors. So there's an element of choosing a position in each of the factors, and you have to make those choices to come up with an individual term. So using that, we can work this out without actually doing our distribution, we can sort of just work our way through the possible combinations of choices. So what do we mean by that? There's one way to choose all the terms from the first position. Then there will be three ways to choose two terms from the first position and one term from the second position. There are going to be three ways to choose one term from the first position and two from the second position. And finally, there's just the one way to choose all terms from the second position. Now, you can work this out. You can crank it out by hand using brute force to compare the results, but you should be able to see that this expansion is what you get. And we could go down this path a lot further and talk about uh, combinations and um, combinatorics. And, uh, but the point here is to emphasize how choosing a term from the expansion really is closely related to choosing positions from each factor along the way. And with that in mind, we're going to go back to our problem of expanding this product. So here's the key principle. Each term in the expansion comes from choosing one of the two positions in each factor and then multiplying them out. So in other words, you have to choose either this guy or this guy. And once you've made that choice, you move on and choose one of these and one of these and so on. And then you multiply those together. So for example, one of the terms you're going to get when you expand this product is obtained by choosing all of the ones and multiplying them out. Now we don't need a theory of infinite products to know that if you multiply one by itself infinitely often, you should get one. And so we get the term one and there are of course more terms. So there's more stuff. Very modest beginning, but we've started our expansion. So now let's find all the terms obtained by choosing one term from the second position and all ones otherwise. So for example, you could choose x squared over pi squared and then choose all ones. And that product must surely be negative x squared over pi squared. So I'll throw that into the mix. You could choose the second position in the second factor and otherwise all ones, and you're going to get negative x squared over four pi squared. You could, in the third term there, you could choose the second position and otherwise all ones, and so on. So now where are we? We claim that those are all the terms you can get by choosing one term from the second position and otherwise all ones. And at this point, we're going to observe that all remaining terms require choosing at least two terms appearing in the second position. So for example, you might have to choose these two second positions. And when you take that product, you're gonna get x to the fourth times something. So all the remaining terms have degree at least four. In other words, they're all gonna have terms that involve x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth, x to the eighth, and so on. And so what we'll do is we'll just add on a, a little notation here that says, well, to expand this, we'll have to have a bunch of other stuff, but it's going to be all terms of degree four or higher. And now 
that's all we need. We're going to be able to uh, follow Euler's footsteps here because what we're going to do is we're going to recall our Taylor series expansion we saw earlier. And here's the key observation. These two expressions are expressions of the same function, so they should be identical um, in the terms. So in other words, the constant terms should agree, and they do. That's good news. But the degree two terms should agree as well. So here we have the degree two terms at, on, the, on the expansion above, and the degree two term in our Taylor expansion is this. These have to agree with each other. So let's just see what that means. We're going to look at these two terms, and we're going to set them equal to each other. And first of all, 1 over 3 factorial is 1 sixth. Then there's the x squared and the pi squared common to all terms, which we can factor out. Now we can divide through the x squareds and multiply through by pi squared, and now we have this equation. And lo and behold, there is Euler's result. The sum of the reciprocal squares is equal to pi squared over 6. Just a remarkable result by a remarkable mathematician, and mind you, he did this in 1735. But if you thought that was impressive, just realize that he continued to find closed form expansions for the sum of the reciprocal even powers of the integers all the way up to 1 over n to the 26. These results are just eye-popping and they stimulated research that continues to this day in higher level mathematics. If you want to take a deeper dive into this subject, another book by William Dunham is, is a great call here. So Euler, the Master of Us All, uh, published by the Mathematical Association of America. Look up chapter three, Euler and Infinite Sums, and um, he'll show you how uh, Euler arrived at these other remarkable sums um, not just the sum of the reciprocal squares, but the fourth power, the sixth power, and so on.